tell the world. Hi, I'm Johnny. This is Johnny Likes, the show where I talk about movies that I like. Today, I'm going to talk about a fantasy movie from the early 2000s. Yeah, I'm going to call it a fantasy movie. It's hard to p pigeonhole this one into a genre. Anyway, Johnny Likes, Donnie Darko. Son. Son. Donnie Darko? Donnie Darko? What the heck's going on here? Who is it, Don? It's Eddie Darko's kid. I'm sorry about this, Jimmy. He's just a neighborhood kid. He's... Donnie Darko stars Jake Gyllenhaal, Jenna Malone, Mary McDonald, Maggie Gyllenhaal, Patrick Swayze, and Drew Barrymore. And it was written and directed by Richard Kelly. The Darko family has a rude awakening when part of a plane crash lands into their house. Luckily, Donnie has psychological issues and is prone to sleepwalking. Otherwise, he'd be dead as the plane part falls exactly in his room. Jenna Malone plays Gretchen Ross, the new girl in town. Her and Donnie have an immediate connection, hit it off, and become an item. Donnie also hallucinates a six-foot-tall, frightening rabbit named Frank. Frank is telling Donnie that the world is going to end in 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, 12 seconds. Which is the end of October, by the way. Now, could 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 the world could 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 the world actually end in thirty days? I saw this movie in late two thousand one or early two thousand two, and was immediately blown away. I was captivated by every aspect of the film. I watched it alone one alone late one night, and immediately just started it over. It was one of those. One of the few times I've done that where I just restarted a film as soon as it was done. I related hard to Donnie as the sensitive outsider as I was around his age and just identified with that. I love the time travel aspect of the film done in a new way that I've not seen before. The cinematography was excellent with lots of gorgeous and inventive shots. The Gyllenhaals announced themselves as massive talents with uh, Jake having a like breakthrough star-making performance. I, I like Jake Gyllenhaal a lot. I think he's one of the most underrated actors out there. Even though he is very well ex respected, I, I just really enjoy seeing, seeing all his performances. He's a guy to watch for me. Cough, man crush. Uh, everyone here is top-notch and fits their part so well. Uh, Patrick Swayze as the sleazy, pseudo-religious motivational speaker. Mm. Uh, Beth Grant as Kitty Farmer, the oh-so-hateable gym teacher. And Drew Barrymore and Noah Wiley as, as the high school teachers who are just trying to do their job. And they can see that Donnie is an intelligent young man. They recognize that he has potential. Jenna Malone as Gretchen, the, the new girl who sees something special in Donnie. The same thing, perhaps, that uh, Drew Barrymore and Noah Wiley see. Also does an excellent job. If you're looking close, you'll also see Seth Rogen in his first on-screen on role. He plays, I don't know what the guy's name is, but it's like bully number two. And also, his first line ever on in a feature film is, I like your boobs. I like your boobs. <laughs> Which is pretty fitting considering his, his lowbrow. Lowbrow, that's what I'm saying. This was uh, pre-YouTube days, and I, I found myself searching out every song that was on the soundtrack. Quick history lesson here for all you young folks. Back before YouTube and Spotify, you had to download a song using software like LimeWire. You've heard LimeWire maybe. The ancients talk about it. This could take some time depending on your internet connection. And by some time, I mean like 45 minutes a song. Alternatively, you could figure out what the song was and which album it came out on. And then you could search the library to see if they had that particular album. And then you would book it. And then you would go there, who knows how long later, until it became available. And then you would rent out the CD. And you would bring it home. And you would play that one song. Or, if they didn't have it, you could take the plunge. And you could spend your hard-earned money at the record store. Like a good chance you'd end up with a CD that had one song on it you liked and the rest was trash. This was our existence. It wasn't cheap, by the way. It was like $15, $20, even more if it was like an import CD. That was like 
two or three or more hours of minimum wage work at the time. So that effort is why you see so many older folks, such as myself, kind of protective of the music that they really identified with and grew up with. It's because there was so much effort involved. It was not so accessible, so it was much more it was much more a part of one's identity. So lesson over. It was my introduction to several of the classic songs and bands featured here. Uh, you got like, for instance, like "Under the Milky Way" by The Church, "Killing Moon" by Equin the Bunny Men, "Notorious" by Duran Duran, "Head Over Heels" by Tears for Fears, "Mad World" by Tears for Fears, and, and "Love Will Tear Us Apart" by Joy Division. Whenever I hear any of these songs in the wild, I immediately think of this movie and scenes from it. And it takes me back to my teenager, teenage years like, like that. And I'm back. So, long story short, love the soundtrack. The narrative in this film is a carefully constructed one, with several elements being open to interpretation. I've listened to the commentary, and even the filmmaker Richard Kelly is... He doesn't strictly define some aspects of what is exactly happening. He leaves it open to the viewer's interpretation. Uh, people are free to discuss what they think happened and why. I've never been one to have to define the events in film as to 100% what happened. I don't need to know what the filmmaker's true intent was and what everything actually meant. Like, I can watch Mulholland Drive and I don't have to know exactly what's going on and I can still have a great time. This one's nowhere near as cryptic, but there still is some ambiguities and a little bit of mental gymnastics involved. <laughs> the depiction of Donnie's mental illness in the film is kind of interesting. He sleepwalks and sees things that aren't there. That's kind of the extent of what we know about it. He jokes with Gretchen that he has personality disorders, but he never defines them past that. He goes to a psychiatrist who is doing her best, and she is using hypnosis as an augmented treatment to the drugs that she has Donnie on. Which he has stopped taking, we learn very early on in the film. We can also never really be sure how much of what is happening on screen is a product purely of Donnie's mind versus something external that's actually happening. There's a humorous awkward moment where under hypnosis Donnie's hand starts wandering while he's fantasizing about Christina Applegate and the therapist has to snap him out of it and they both both exchange an awkward glance. This is also one of the first films that I remember seeing that had that full-on nostalgia for the 1980s. For me, as a teenager in the early aughts, the 1980s seemed like about a thousand years ago, even though in reality this film takes place about 12 or 13 years after it was released, or before it was released, which is like if a film today had nostalgia for 20 like 2010. That's That does not not seem so long ago to me. It's funny how time works. There are many time period appropriate pieces of pop culture to appreciate here as well. From Rose Darko reading Stephen King's It, to the soundtrack we hear, to Donnie going to a double feature which plays The Evil Dead and The Last Temptation of Christ as the second billing. This movie also had a really cool website where you could go and view bonus content and kind of film adjacent stuff, kind of like DLC almost. I don't remember exactly what it had, but I'm pretty sure it had some philosophy of time excerpts. Just a cool design overall, which in 2001, 2002, was fairly unusual. Not a lot of films or movie studios had kind of realized the power of the internet. And it was a great place for fans of the film to go who wanted more. It just helped to build a fandom. This was a word of mouth movie. It made like no money at the box office and I'd never heard of it. It just showed up one day in the new releases section of the video store. I actually thought it looked dumb the first time I saw it and I had no interest in it. It's another one of those movies where my parents rented it and I came home late one night and watched it because it was there and there was nothing on TV. There are two different versions of this film. 
there's the theatrical cut and the director's cut. And this is one of the few times where I actually prefer the theatrical cut. The director's cut switches up some of the music. Uh, Killing Moon is no longer the opening song and adds more explanation and details to the film, uh, including section break cards and some excerpts from the Philosophy of Time book by that Roberta Sparrow, i.e. Grandma Death, wrote. I would recommend watching both versions, as they are both excellent, but I would start with the theatrical. It's a bit more streamlined, and it has... A little bit more of a dreamlike and a little bit psychedelic quality. Uh, this is one of those films where, for me, pretty much every aspect of the film is perfect in the way it is. I'm sure there are some aspects that bug people or, pl or plot holes I overlooked. But for me, this is undoubtedly a 5 out of 5 movie. I saw it at just the right age, where it had a massive effect on me, and I can't really overlook that. I can't separate myself from that. If I saw it today for the first time, I might rate it a little bit less, but it's still a very fine film. I think it holds up great, and it's from a first-time writer-director, nonetheless. I miss Richard Kelly. He only did a few films, and from what I can kind of gleam from various interviews he's done is that Hollywood basically burnt him out from the filmmaking process. I believe his third film, uh, Southland Tales, when he was at Cannes or one of the big famous festivals. It got like booed, which is just shitty. I don't usually, I don't curse on the channel, but that's a shitty thing to do. That movie is not that bad, does not deserve that. It was actually kind of good. I liked his other films. They were curious and definitely watchable and not booable. Yeah, that, that's rough. So if you're watching that, please come back, Richard Kelly. We like you. I'd like to see more of your work. I enjoy it. With all that said, uh, here's some other films that you might like. This one's a tough one to do recommendations for, but we'll give it a shot. I mentioned Mulholland Drive earlier. Yeah, check that one out. Basically, I think it's the same year or very close to. Wild Ride, that one. Another one, Vanilla Sky. Uh, if you're not a Tom Cruise fan, yeah, sorry, that one is... That one took me by surprise, for sure. And also Dark City. That is another good late 90s kind of mind bender. So what do you guys think the best debut film from a writer-director is? What's the best film with uh, time travel involved? And what's the best ambiguous film with like a million fan theories as to what actually happens? Let me know in the comments and do me a favor please and like and subscribe. It's quick, free, and relatively painless, plus it really helps me out. Thanks for watching me talk about movies for a little while, and you can tune in next time to see what else Johnny likes.